Guess what, guys? People are still hacking Splatoon in 2020. Splatoon was another game I didn't care about when it was first announced. I didn't grow up with many shooting games. I used to have Goldeneye and Turok 2 for the Nintendo 64, but I played them like a combined total of five times before we got rid of them. So for the better half of a decade, my gun game of choice was the multiplayer from Banjo-Tooie. Don't sleep on it. Anyways, when Splatoon was first revealed, I thought it was lame. The main reason was because the mode that was shown off at the game's debut was the least interesting of its modes, and I'll talk about those later, but the point of me saying this all is that it took a while for me to come around on Splatoon, and here's why. The month before the game released, there was a special demo that was available a few times to let people try it out, and I had fun with it, but it wasn't $60 fun, if you know what I mean. I wound up waiting a few months, and other than a price drop, another reason I hesitated to buy the game was because Splatoon wasn't going to have a ton of content on day one. This is when Nintendo started this annoying trend with their games, where free DLC would slowly become available after the game is out. So on day one, Splatoon only started with five maps, one online mode, barely any clout on my guy Krusty Sean, and a limited selection of weapons and clothes. Every week there'd be a new update, including a weapon, and sometimes a map or new clothes would be there too. It's supposed to encourage people to play the game longer, but all it does is make me disappointed with the base game, and then the DLC comes out after I've moved on. So like I said, I bought the game a few months after it came out, and since a bunch of the free DLC was already out, I probably had more fun than I would've if I bought the game right away. And in this video I'll be talking about the intricacies of the online modes and my experience with the metagame in Splatoon 1 for the Wii U. There is a story mode, but I'll save that for another time. Where to begin, I guess I'll start with the controls. For all of you who brilliantly didn't invest in the Wii Party U machine, this game requires you to play with the gamepad. Now before I explain how the gamepad affects gameplay, I should probably explain what you do in Splatoon. Well, to sum things up, you shoot, you squid, you kid, and you gyro. The main thing you'll be doing is covering the ground, which lets you swim in it, giving you an increased speed and more options for stealth. It's a simple concept, and its execution is perfect. There's one other technique you can do with the character's ability to turn into a squid where you rapidly tap the squid button, and jumping is optional, but when you do it after splatting somebody, it lowers their morale while also rising your own. Some people call it wave dashing, squid begging, I mean squid begging. And one other tool you can use is super jumping. The gamepad always displays a map, which lets you see when turf is covered in real time, and also shows you where your teammates are, and if you touch their icon, you can jump to where they are, or you can hit the bottom right corner to return to your spawn. It's really helpful for getting back into the action, but my favorite part about it is that sometimes you can press the button to instantly die. So now let's talk about the weapons. The main weapon classes are guns, snipers, and roly-poly guacamoles. I like to categorize guns by their range, because with the standard guns at least, a few of them will share the same range but have other characteristics like strength and speed that set them apart from each other. I'm just going to cherry pick the long range guns since I'm most familiar with them. The choices are the 96 gal, which shoots slowly with splats and two hits the Splattershot Pro, which is a slightly faster gun that takes 3 hits to splat, and then the Dual Squelcher, which is even faster but splats in 4 hits. Beginner players might favor the quicker guns because of their speed, but the 4 hit kill can be a real doozy if you can't get close to your target. I actually used to main the Dual Squelcher, but now I prefer the 96. Snipers are pretty strong, like ridiculously strong, I think they're the best weapons in the game, especially the Splatter Scope and the E-Leader. I haven't explained the modes at all, so sharing my knowledge on the weapons is kind of pointless, but snipers have this innate ability to make you want to kill yourself. I love it! They're amazing at zoning, and whichever team has more snipers should win 100% of the time. And the last of the weapon classes are the Rollers. They're melee weapons, and I don't have much to say about them because I never use them, but they certainly have their role in the metagame. There's a few other weapons like Gatlings and Sloshers, but the only time I'll be caught dead with a bucket is when I'm kicking it. So let's move on to the sub-weapons and special weapons. Subs and specials are extra tools each weapon comes equipped with, but they can't be changed at all, so it's best to pick a weapon with a sub and special combination you like to use. Sub-weapons are usually bombs, or a surprise tool that will help us later, and just about every sub-weapon is viable except for the diffuser and point sensor, which are very situational. My favorite sub is the Splat Bomb, but I think the best are Beacons, which are severely underutilized. If you set one down, anyone on your team can super jump to it, and even if nobody uses them, they add an immeasurable amount of pressure against your opponents. Imagine spikes from Pokemon. If you know, you know. Special weapons are like sub-weapons, but better. I mean, obviously. Most people will tell you that Kraken is busted because it's invincible and has an insta-kill melee attack, and not for its hentai capabilities. But the real best special is the Echo Locator, which reveals where all of your opponents are for 9 seconds. Now my opponents can see my teammates slacking off. 
The other specials aren't bad, I just thought I'd highlight the best ones. And then each weapon has a variant or two featuring different combinations of subs and specials, giving a few options if you really want to use a certain weapon. So if you like the end zap but hate winning, there's a kit for that. Yeah, no modes and maps yet. I need to talk about the clothing and abilities. There's hats, shirts, and Yeezys, and they all come with a pre-installed ability and have the capacity for three or more abilities with weaker effects. There's a ton of complexity with picking abilities, and to give you the short version, it sucks. Getting gear with good abilities is extremely tedious. The best way is to get clothes with a specific brand because each brand has one ability they have a higher chance of getting, but the odds you'll get three of the same ability on your clothes is less than a 3% chance. And without optimizing with the brands, it's a solid 0.02%. And if you want to reroll once, it takes like two hours of playing online to earn enough money to do that. Thank god they made it easier in Splatoon 2. And how about those abilities? Their buffs like increase speed, attack, defense, smell like salami, fill up your special meter faster, stuff like that. And then some abilities are exclusive to only hats or only shoes like the cold blooded ability on shirts which halves the time an echolocator is used on you, or the stealth jump ability on shoes which gets rid of the icon that tells everyone where you're gonna land after doing a super jump. Here's the kit I normally use. We got the signature pith helmet, a cold blooded shirt, and some moccasins. I wouldn't say any stat is particularly better than the rest, but some stats like the ink savers and attack ups are more applicable, so you'll usually see more people wearing stuff like cyan trainers and the jungle hat because their preset ability and brand combos give you those good abilities. And like I said, trying to get three of the same ability is a commitment. Alright, let's finally talk about the actual game. Initially, you can only play Turf Wars until you reach level 10, which takes about 3-4 to four hours, and unlocks the ranked modes. Turf Wars are pretty simple, you have 3 minutes to cover the ground in ink, and whichever team has more turf covered when the time is up wins. It doesn't matter if you try to splat your enemies in this mode, since that isn't the objective, but if you do, it takes around 6 seconds plus shipping and handling time to get back into action, so there are benefits to learning how to aim. I'm not a huge fan of Turf Wars, I just don't think it's satisfying to play, and there's a good chance your teammates would rather have a squid party, or hackers will show up. So the only reason i play Turf Wars would be to test a new weapon, or participate in Splatfest. And Splatfest were these cool monthly events Nintendo would do, where they'd pit two options against each other, like cats versus dogs, and then whichever team does better, wins. It sounds really fun on paper, but most of the time I just pick the team I didn't think kids would choose. Because, let's be honest, kids are shit at video games, and I have no problem dunking on little Timmy for some extra sea snails. There was Pirates vs Ninjas, well kids are obviously gonna pick Ninjas. Early Birds vs Night Owls, most kids got a curfew, so... Tits vs Ass, <laughs> that's an easy one. Pokemon Red vs Pokemon Blue, alright I was gonna pick Blue no matter what. But the very last Splatfest was between Callie and Marie, the two hosts of... We could have just made a graphic telling you what the maps were, but instead we're gonna waste your time for a minute making really dry banter instead. The show. And what made this Splatfest cool was that the winner was gonna have a key role in Splatoon 2. What's that, the candy idea, but it still looks like that from an outsider's perspective? Well, what the heck. The winner was pretty obvious for this one. Marie was always popular online. Uh, even though the popular vote gap was only 8%. Hey, shout out to Green. And finally, the ranked modes. I got so hooked on these things. There's splat zones where teams compete to control a specific plot of land on the map. Tower control, which features a tower in the center of the map that moves toward your opponent's spawn when you stand on it and Rainmaker, which is like tower control, but instead the tower is a super powerful gun that slows you down. Before I go a little more in depth about each mode, I want to mention that Splatoon has this awful system where only one of the three ranked modes would be available at any one time. So for a 4 hour block, people could only play Rainmaker, then for the next 4 hours only Splat Zones could be played. So that's really annoying to deal with if you have a tight schedule and want to play a specific mode, but guess what, you have to play a mode you hate instead. And what made this system even worse is that only 2 of the game's 16 maps could be played during those 4 hours. So sometimes I'd boot up the game and see it's Splat Zones with Bluefin Depot and Urchin Underpass, so I'd just turn the game off because I'm really not interested in breaking my TV. So let's start with Splat Zone, since I just said I hate it, and the main reason is because I suck at it. Yeah, it's that simple. I like to play defensively, and I feel like this mode favors aggressive gameplay. On most maps, there will be a marked spot in the center, and once one team has covered about three quarters of the turf, the zone will be under their control until the other team can take it from them. There's a timer that goes down when a team controls the Splat Zone, and if they lose it, they'll be penalized with a time extension. Some maps have two Splat Zones, which is supposed to be more strategic, but in my experience these maps are worse, because the zones are in spots that usually give the losing team fewer options to make a comeback. There's one special weapon that gets used on this map a lot, the Ink Strike. It can cover a large chunk of the zone in a single hit that can either stop the opponent's time or even take control of the zone, but it's not overpowered since it can be recovered quickly if your team isn't there to keep it in control. 
Tower control happens to be my next favorite. This mode and Rainmaker are more fun because the objective is always moving. I'd compare them to football, I guess, where you win if you score a touchdown. As long as one person is standing on the tower, it'll start moving towards the goal, and it goes faster if more people are standing on it. But usually you'll want one person standing on the tower while the other three run ahead to guard it. Chalk it up to me sucking, but I like to be the guy on the tower, because my mindset is always, if you want something done, do it yourself. Because whenever I play offense, my team is picking dandelions on the outfield or sucking their thumbs. Like, where are they? The tower follows a set path, so you can usually plan out where you should be when playing offense or defense. And one last thing to note about the tower itself is that there's a pole on the center for expletive material and hiding behind. Some weapons that are great in tower control are blasters, splash walls, krakens, bubblers, and killer whales. Blaster shots have a huge radius, so they can bypass the pole on the tower. Splash walls aren't common, but you can strategically throw one up to protect you on the tower for a few seconds. Krakens and bubblers are effectively splash walls since so they keep you invincible on the tower for a few seconds, and killer whales are an instant Chinese fire drill special. I'm pretty sure the attack goes on for a few thousand light years at least, so you're probably killing aliens from another planet every time you use it. Rainmaker also has this goal of bringing a football-like item toward your opponent's spawn, but unlike tower control, it's anything goes in this one. Like I said earlier, the Rainmaker is a weapon that slows down the holder, and you can't let it go once it's in your possession. You gotta bring that sucker to the goal, or die trying. And what makes this mode so fun is that there's usually more than one way to the goal, which adds layers of strategy in playing offense and defense. Most maps usually have one way that's objectively better, but the nice thing is that every option is viable. And just like tower control, I'm a dirty little rainmaker hog. If I can grab it, I will take it, because whenever my teammates have it and die, it's their fault. And whenever I have it and die, it was because they weren't there to defend me. It's flawless logic. And sometimes I'll grab it, even if I'll die right away, just to prolong my exposure to its peer. Immaculation. Like, I'm pretty sure my teammates would strangle me because of all the times I've grabbed the rainmaker just to die, because we weren't ready to push it forward yet. But who's the one with all the W's under their belt? Bow, my peasants. One of my favorite Rainmaker strats that most people don't use is timer stalling, and not like dying just to save 5 seconds. True timer stalling is when you're winning and there's like 30 seconds left so you bring the Rainmaker back to your spot until time runs out. The one downside is that if they splat you and somehow win because of it, you have to organize a funeral appointment afterwards. You, you gotta just kill yourself. I'm sorry man, it's just that's the, those are the rules. I wouldn't say there's any specific weapons that excel in Rainmaker, whatever's good will be good here, but I like to use sprinklers and killer whales because they open the Rainmaker bubble quicker so I can have it sooner. I mean it's my property, you don't let strangers hold baby, you know? I gotta take it back and put her in the crib and tuck in night night. So now that I've talked about the modes, here's the maps you play them on. Back in 2017, I made a video ranking all 16 of the maps, but to give you a summary, here's a tier list. D tier is Anchovy Games. I simply suck on this map. I hate every mode here, and I feel like I can never play offense or defense without dying. C tier is Flounder Heights, Urchin Underpass, and Piranha Pits. All these maps have flaws to them that make me not want to play them for very long. Piranha Pits has its spawns too close to the center. Urchin Underpass is way too easy to play defense on, and Flounder Heights isn't as bad, but the walls are annoying to deal with. B tier are the mediocre maps. There's Hammerhead Bridge, Black Belly Skate Park, Bluefin Depot, Port Mackerel, and Salt Spray Rig. Salt Spray Rig used to be one of my favorites, but the Rainmaker and Tower Control were both removed from rank modes because of exploits, and I love these two modes on this map. There's a few other maps where a mode was removed for exploits, usually the Rainmaker, because some maps can get nutty, and the lack of those modes affects my perception of them. Port Mackerel is another map where defense is too easy to play. Bluefin Depot has an amazing Rainmaker, but it's crazy difficult to get a knockout on. If you have, put that on your resume. I rank it so low because I hate it splat some with a passion. Black Belly Skate Park is super average. I don't love anything about it, but I don't hate anything about it either. And Hammerhead Bridge has a fun gimmick with the bridges, but the map is just too big. A tier includes Camp Triggerfish, Arowana Mall, Museum de Alfonsino, and Walleye Warehouse. Walleye Warehouse is average like Black Belly Skate Park, but the map design itself is better overall. Museum de Alfonsino has a fun gimmick, but playing offense can be tough sometimes. Arowana Mall is fun if you like snipers, otherwise you'll have a bad time. And Camp Triggerfish would be S tier if the splat zones were just a bit more fun. And then the trifecta that is S tier features Mahi Mahi Resort, Kelp Dome, and Moray Towers. The key features of these maps is that on all three ranked modes, I feel like comebacks are always possible, and that's because these maps give plenty of options. You can clutch out a victory more often on these maps than the rest, which makes them fun to play on because they feel so balanced. Moray Towers is usually dominated by snipers, but the map gives plenty of paths and walls to avoid them, and the map uses its large size amazingly by giving losing teams plenty of offensive options. Kelp Dome has a design to it where it feels like you always have options. Like you can enter the center from the opponent's base if you want. 
And then Mahi Mahi Resort has this awesome gimmick where the map transforms after one team hits a certain milestone. And they somehow made the transformation feel fair, even though it's meant to give the losing team more options. So that does it for the online gameplay of Splatoon 1. I really liked its meta game, even though most people would use the same weapons. Like, I didn't even mention how popular the Ted Detect Splattershot was when the game was super active. There'd usually be more of these guys in every match than snipers, and I can't tell you why, because the Ted Detect wasn't as threatening as snipers were. And even though the game was severely limited with its map and mode rotation system, I had a lot of fun with it, and I'd even go as far as saying it's my favorite game for the Wii U. And like I said, I'll hopefully get around to talking about the game story mode another day, but before I let you guys go, I gotta give you a little taste of They Call Me Mr. Vector, a Splatoon combo video. Hit it! There's a link for that video in the end card, but that's going to be for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a like as well if the channel grows. Subscribe to get updates on my uploads as soon as they happen. But until then, I'll see you all next time.